Please remain seated. The show will begin in three, two. Like a hell cut. <laughs> Hello, ghoul friends. Those are freaky chic, fans of the supernatural and all things spooky. I'm your host, Phantom Traveler 87, and welcome back to my channel, my very own dark, creepy corner of paradise, where I dive deep into the exploration of the unknown, the unusual, and the morbid. And before I continue on with sharing with you this next terrifying tale, I just want to say thank you again so much for listening, and of course your support is always appreciated, as well as your patience. I know that I don't upload a video every day. I try to upload as much as I possibly can, but considering my hectic work schedule, sometimes with fluctuating hours and, well, having to juggle with personal life, it's not always possible. But I do the best that I can to provide the best entertainment for you guys as I possibly can. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe and hit the bell to get all notifications for future uploads. Now, let's dive back into the crypt for this next scary story. I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. When I was a small child, I was terrified of the dark. I still am, but back when I was around six years old, I couldn't go a full night without crying out for one of my parents to search beneath my bed or in my closet for whatever monster I thought was waiting to eat me. Even with a nightlight, I would still see dark shapes moving around the corners of my room, or strange faces looking in on me from my bedroom window. My parents would do their best to console me, telling me that it was just a bad dream or a trick of the light, but in my young mind I was positive that the second I fell asleep, the bad things would get me. Most of the time I would just hide underneath the blankets until I became tired enough to stop worrying, but every now and then I would become so panicked that I would run screaming into my parents' room, waking up my brother and sister in the process. After an ordeal like that, there would be no way anyone would be getting a full night's rest. Eventually, after one particularly traumatizing night, my parents had had enough. Unfortunately for them, they understood that the futility in arguing with a six-year-old and knew that they would be unable to convince me to rid myself of childish fears through reason and logic. They had to be clever. It was my mother's idea to stitch together my little bedtime friend. She collected a large assortment of random pieces of fabric and her sewing machine and created what I would later refer to as Mr. Inkbar Bigelstein, or Ick for short. Ick was a sock monster, as my mother called him. He was made to keep me safe while I slept at night by scaring away all the other monsters. He was pretty damn creepy, I had to admit. Honestly, looking back on it all now, I'm still impressed that my mom could think of something so strange and disturbing looking. Ichbar had the stitched together look of a Frankenstein gremlin with big white button eyes and floppy cat ears. His little arms and legs were made from a pair of my sister's black and white striped socks and the half of his face that was green was made from one of my brother's tall football socks. His head could have been described as bulbous and for his mouth, my mom attached a piece of white fabric and sewed in a zigzag pattern to shape a wide grin of sharp teeth. I loved him at once. From then on, Ick never left my side. So long, it was after dusk, of course. Ick didn't like the sun and would get upset if I tried to bring him to school with me. But that was okay. I only needed him at night to keep away the boogeyman, which was what he was good at. So every night at bedtime, Ick would tell me where the monsters were hiding, and I would place them near the section of my room closest to the spookiness. 
If there was something in the closet, Ick would block the door. If there was a dark creature scratching at my window, Ick would be pressed up against the glass. If there was a big hairy beast under my bed, then under the bed he went. Sometimes the monsters weren't even in my room. Sometimes they would hide in my dreams. And Ickbar would have to come with me into my nightmares. It was fun bringing Ick into my dream world, as he and I would spend hours fighting off ghouls and demons. The best part was in my dreams, Ick could talk to me for real. How much do you love me? He would ask. More than anything, I would always tell him. One night in a dream, after I had lost my first tooth, Ick asked me for a favor. Can I have your tooth? I asked him why. To help me kill the bad things, he said. The next morning at breakfast, my mom asked me where my tooth went. From what she told me, the tooth fairy didn't find it under my pillow. When I told her that I gave it to Ickbar, she just shrugged and went off to feed my little sister. From then on, every time I lost a tooth, I'd give it to Ick. He would always thank me, of course, and tell me that he loved me. Eventually, though, I ran out of baby teeth, and I was beginning to get a little too old to be still playing with dolls. So Ick just sat there on my bookshelf collecting dust, slowly fading away from my attention. Over time, the nightmares, however, became worse than ever, so bad that they even began to follow me in the waking world, terrorizing every dark corner or rustle in the bushes. After one particularly bad night, biking home from a friend's house, where I swore a pack of rabid dogs were chasing me, I got home to find something strange waiting for me in my room. There, on my bed, standing fully upright in the soft glow of the moon, light from my window, was Ickbar. At first, I just thought my eyes were just playing tricks on me again. They had been all evening, so I tried to flick on the lights. Another flick of the light switch. Then another and another. With no change, the darkness. It was then that I started to get nervous. I backed away slowly towards the door behind me my eyes never leaving the shape of Ick's silhouette, my hand awkwardly outstretched behind reaching for the doorknob. I was just about to get my ass out of there when I heard the door slam itself shut, locking me into blackness. In nothing but shadows and silence, I stood frozen in place, not even breathing. For how long, I can't say, but after what felt like a lifetime of cold fear, I heard the shrill, familiar voice. You stopped feeding me. So why should I protect you? Protect me from what? Let me show you. I blinked once and everything changed. I wasn't in my bedroom anymore. I was somewhere else. It wasn't hell, but the comparison wasn't far off. It was some sort of forest, a horrible nightmarish place, where partial embryonic abortions hung from the canopy and the ground swarmed with carnivorous insects. A thick fog wafted through the air and with it the stench of rotting meat. While chartreuse lighting flashed across the night sky, in the distance I could hear the agonizing screams of something not quite human. My head throbbed like it was about to explode, the pain forcing out a river of tears. In my mind I heard his voice again. This is what your reality would become without me. I felt earth shaking footsteps approaching fast. I am the only one who can stop it. It was behind me now, huge and angry, hot breath across my back. Bring me what I need and I will. I woke up before I could turn around. The following day, I raided my parents' closet for my brother's baby teeth, giving them all to Ikbar. Almost immediately, the night terror seized, and I was more or less able to go on about my life as normal. From time to time, I would have to sneak into my little sister's room and snatch what was meant for the tooth fairy, or strangle one of the neighborhood cats and pry out its sharp little incisors. Anything to ward off the visions, anything from a shark tooth necklace to a cavity-ridden ficus pit. I almost began to notice that Ick would move about my room whenever I left for any length of time, rearranging my stuff and hanging additional curtains. He was even beginning to look more lifelike now. In the right light, his teeth would glisten, and he was warm to the touch. As much as he creeped me out, I couldn't work up the curtain to just destroy him knowing perfectly well where that would leave me. So I went on collecting teeth for Ick throughout all of high school and college. The older I got, the more things I would learn to fear. The more teeth Ick would need to keep me safe.
I'm 22 years old now with a decent job, my own apartment, and a set of dentures. It's been almost a month since Ick's last meal, and the horrors are starting to crowd around me once more. I took a detour through a parking garage after work tonight, found a man fumbling with his car keys. His teeth were stained yellow from a lifetime of cigarettes and coffee. Even still, I had to use a hammer to get out the molars. When I got back to my apartment, he was waiting for me. On the ceiling in the corner, two white eyes and mouth of razors. How much do you love me? He asked. More than anything, I replied, taking off my coat. More than anything in the world. One summer night, a teenage boy was going out on a date with his new girlfriend. He picked her up at her house and they drove out to the edge of town. They parked the car in a secluded spot that was a well-known lover's lane. As they gazed out at the lights of the town, the boy put his arm around the girl and switched on the car radio so they could listen to some romantic music. He leaned over and the young couple began kissing and cuddling. Just as they were getting in the mood, the music stopped suddenly and a newsreader's voice came on the radio. This is an emergency announcement. Earlier tonight, a crazed murderer escaped from the state mental asylum. Police are warning citizens to be on their guard since the patient is considered armed and dangerous. The insane killer is nicknamed the Hook Man because after he lost his right hand in an accident, it was replaced with a steel hook. Everyone in the area should be on the lookout for a man fitting this description. If you see anything suspicious, you should report it to the police immediately. The girl became frightened and asked to be taken home. She knew that the state insane asylum was not far from the lover's lane. She was also worried that the remote area where they were parked was the perfect spot for a deranged madman to lurk. The boy was feeling brave and assured his girlfriend that they were perfectly safe. He locked all the doors and tried to kiss her again. The girl became frantic and pushed him away, insisting that they leave immediately. In a huff, the boy slammed the car into gear and spun his wheels as he pulled out of the parking space. On the way back to town, they both calmed down, but the girl still held on tightly to her boyfriend. When they pulled up outside the girl's house, the boy got out of the car and walked around to open the door for his girlfriend. For a long time, he just stood there, staring at the door. At first, the girl couldn't figure out what was wrong. Then she realized that her door was still locked. She smiled and unlocked it. Still, the boy just stood there. The girl was puzzled and rolled down her window. Then she saw that the boy was staring down at the door handle. Slowly, she looked down at herself and began to scream uncontrollably. There hanging from the door handle was a bloody, stainless steel hook. Everyone has precious childhood memories that they hold on to. It's not until you grow up when you realize those memories are truly nightmares. I had recently finished my final year at school and had decided to enjoy my last summer vacation at my hometown. My parents rarely use my childhood home anymore. They only use it in the beginning of each year for a month or two. So I decided to live there for the time being. My parents told me they were fine with it over a phone call saying, as long as I pay the bills, which I was fine with. I hadn't been in my hometown for a year, so I lost my job as a grocery store bagger. I decided to resort to the newspaper ad since I was too lazy to go driving around town or searching online for one. I flipped through the employment section for the newspaper. Babysitter, no. Exterminator, nah. Newspaper delivery, nope. I did a good five minutes of scanning till I came across a rather interesting one. It was a job for one of my favorite childhood places, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Freddy's was an awesome place that my mother took me to whenever my father wasn't in town, or I just behaved long enough to get a special treat. Unfortunately, the job was for a security guard during the night. Not my ideal position, but I just couldn't turn down Freddy. I immediately circled the ad with my pen and called up the pizzeria. They said I could have the job without getting an interview. They just asked for my name, Mike Schmidt, and my age 23. 
I was then told that I could start this summer, June to be exact. I was a little surprised. This summer? I began to rethink even working here. But then I remember all the cash I earned while at my job in college. I'd have enough money to get by for the next month. I decided to take the job. Yes, I cheered, knowing that I have a job at one of my favorite childhood places ever, and that the job doesn't take up any of my time during my day. I then went upstairs to my old room to sleep, knowing I'd be alright this summer and coming fall. The next day I decided to take a little tour of my old town. I did a good walk down Main Street, went through the community park and even passed by Freddy's. It was good to look at that place again. I didn't want to go inside because I'm sure people would find it weird for a grown man with no child to walk into a children's place of happiness. Basically I'd look like a, a weirdo. While walking down one of the busiest streets in my town, I saw a newspaper article stating murder case of five children reopens in bold letters on the top. I didn't want to take too long of a glance at it, but then I realized that the picture to go along with the title was Freddy Fazbear. I was confused and decided to take a copy and read it. Supposedly a man dressed up like Freddy Fazbear lured children away from their parents to kill them. I was shocked and disgusted with whoever would do this. The next couple of months weren't, weren't eventful. None of my childhood friends returned home like I did, even knowing I was here. I saw some old relatives and my parents thought about visiting me, but blew me off. Heck, I even went out on two dates with this beautiful girl who I realized was just using me to get back at her ex. I didn't really even do anything special besides that. I just lied around on the couch watching movies and TV shows. Things went on and on like that until November came. November 8th, to be exact. It was my first day on the job. I had little money left, so it was good to finally start getting an income again. Night one, it was Monday night, and I was about to head out to the pizzeria. I was a bit excited and worried at the same time. Excited because I was starting a new job at one of my favorite childhood spots, and worried because I would be there all night. I was planning on sleeping the whole day to rest up for the rest of the night. But I just couldn't fall asleep. Oh well, I said to myself, not giving it too much thought. When I arrived at Freddy's, a man was waiting outside for me. Hello, are you the owner here? I asked. Who wants to know? He responded. I'm Mike Smith, here for the night watch job, I said. Oh yes, how could I forget? Who else would be here at 12 a.m.? He chuckled. Neighborhood watch, I added, laughing slightly. Are you the one who's going to teach me the basics, I continued. Nah, I'm just the owner, as you guessed. But I'm here to give you a pair of keys to the place. Your mentor left a message for you in the security office. Well, here you go. He handed me the keys. Remember, your shift always starts at 12 a.m. and doesn't end until 6 a.m. You got it, he asked, sounding a bit anxious. Yes, of course, sir, I replied. Good. Well, good night, son. Don't mess this up or else you're out, he said, walking towards his car. Good night, I called, but I do not think he heard me. I then opened the door to the place. Fortunately, he left it unlocked for me. Not that it was much of a deal, if it wasn't. After all, I had keys. I then looked around the place. A huge sense of nostalgia hit me like a ginormous wave. I then recalled sitting at the party tables with my mother and friends, eating pizza and watching Freddie and the band sing. I then looked to the stage. There they were. Freddy, Chica, and Bonnie. Oh, how nice it was to recite those names again. After I relived my childhood memories, I then scanned the rest of the building, looking for the security office. My guess was that it was in the back of the building, which it was. I peeked in to see that there was no one in there. I walked into the room, somewhat annoyed by the sounds of the rotary fan. I thought about turning it off, but then I realized how warm the room was. I had no choice but to keep it running. I also noticed a little beep sound going off every couple seconds. I located the sound to be a message machine. I pressed the play button. A voice came on. I was surprised and wondered who it was. Was it my mentor? Hello? 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 Um, hi! I'm the old security guard at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Hopefully you're getting this message. I need to explain to you what to do. Now I'm actually finishing my last week here. That's why you're getting my job. I got my hours changed to 8 to 11.30 p.m., since I didn't have to be up so late anymore. Sorry, that's your job now. Now, um, let me explain to you the basics, so you can get through your first week. Now, on the 
the table you're hopefully at, you should see a tablet. I glanced over the table and saw that the man was right. There was a large tablet with gray trim sitting on the table. I picked it up and turned it on. If you see it, turn it on. The first thing you should see is a camera view of the main show stage, along with a lot of different square buttons on a map. Those square buttons are actually all security cameras that you need to check every now and then to make sure someone or something didn't break into this place. The map is actually a whole layout of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, so you can get a pretty good idea of where things are. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who in their right mind would sneak into a child's place of fun? People aren't the problem here. It's actually the animatronics. You know, Freddy and his pals. I was confused. I tapped each camera looking around, seeing if anything was in the building. There was nothing. What I meant by that, he continued, is that the animatronics get a little quirky at night. They're left in some sort of free roam mode at night for some reason and walk around the whole building. They used to be able to do that during the day, but then there was the bite of 87. Yeah, I don't want to go too deep into that, but let me just say that it's shocking that the human body can survive without the frontal lobe. I was getting a little creeped out now, checking the cameras again to find once more nothing. I'm going to move on now. Now the characters here, when they see you, will not actually see you as a worker because it's nighttime. They'll actually see you as an endoskeleton without its costume on. Now, since that's against the rules here at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, they'll try to forcefully shove you into a Freddy Fazbear suit. Now, that would not be so bad if it weren't for the suits being filled with animatronic devices and crossbeams, especially around the facial area. So, um, you can understand. That would cause a bit of discomfort and, uh, death. The only parts of your body that would see the light of day again would be your eyeballs and teeth when they pop out of the front of the mask. I was actually shocked now. I didn't know what to do. I checked the camera once more to see that Bonnie was no longer on stage. I was filled with fear and anxiety while I checked the rest of the cameras. I then saw Bonnie standing in the audience area. I was so scared and then paid close attention to what the man said next. I just want you to know that there is a really, really, really nothing for you to worry about. It may sound scary, yeah, but really, you'll be fine. Now let me explain to you what happens if a character gets a little too close to you. Next to you, there are buttons for each door. One for closing the door, and the other for enabling the door lights. I tested it out. He was right. The doors and lights would open and close and turn on and off on command. I once again checked the cameras to see that Bonnie was in the hall right next to me. I was prepared to close the door if it came closer. Frequently, check those lights to see if a character is out there. Don't be worried at all. But if you ever do see a character, close the door. As soon as they're gone, you can open them back up. Also, keep an eye on a specific character in Pirate Cove. It seems to respond if the camera is on and off for too long. Just don't worry. You'll be fine. First day will be a breeze. Check those cameras and oh yeah, make sure you don't run out of power. You only get a certain amount each night. Using all the appliances wastes more of it. So conserve it. Talk to you tomorrow. Good night. The message ended. I checked my cameras and sure enough, it had a power percentage there. It said I have 80%. Wow, 20% gone in 5 minutes. Maybe it's because I left the screens on all this time. That might be a bad idea. What else did he say? A character in Pirate Cove? I never remembered that place as a child. I then checked through the cameras until I found Pirate Cove. There was a curtain there, but it was closed. I took that as a good sign. I then checked the hall where Bonnie was to see if she was there. I came to the conclusion that with a name like Bonnie, it must be a girl. She wasn't there. I checked the camera closest to me to see that she wasn't there either. I was confused. She wouldn't just leave the area. I then decided to check those door lights. Nothing on the right. Then I checked the left and to my disbelief, there was Bonnie staring at me. I smashed the door button as hard and as fast as I possibly could. I was terrified, but then realized that they weren't real people trying to hurt me. They were just robots. I calmed down and pressed the door light button to see if I could see Bonnie's shadow or something. There was nothing showing that Bonnie was there. Hesitantly, I opened the door and to my surprise, Bonnie wasn't there. The night went on pretty similar to that. Bonnie got close to me a couple times and the curtain of Pirate Cove opened a little bit, but I saw nothing in there. Chica and Freddy stayed on stage, thankfully, and I finished the night with 14% of power to spare. 
I overcame my fears of them trying to kill me and simply thought they were just trying to play. I left Freddy's and went home to sleep the day away. I was exhausted. 